I can yeah. sit back. Yeah, okay. now you can sit back. Yeah. There, you can. there we go. Relax. Yeah. What are you going to be uh, teaching this uh, coming semester slash quarter? I don't know what. This it's is semesters, going. but I'm not teaching anything. Oh, you're just researching? Yeah. for the. I mean, I will teach eventually, but I don't have anything in my load nice. for the fall. I know. I'm so excited. So I'm just going to be reading things that I haven't had time to read that I should be reading. Um, is this kind of like a pre-sabbatical? Because you just you just moved colleges. This is an odd way for well, you to... Well, so my, my job is... Um, I'm at an institute at the university. So my primary job is to support the mission of the institute. And they have a lot of programming that they do. Um, and then they're... There are both professors and non-professor staff people who work for the institute, um, and the professors usually teach like a course a semester in their various disciplines. And mm -hmm. so eventually, I'll be doing that. Mm -hmm. But right now, I just don't have to do that yet. Okay. So they're yeah. they're giving me kind of time to settle in and figure out what my what my job is exactly. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> With all the phone books behind you. <laughs> I know. I'm like, this is such a not a fun. I no, could it's fine. It's fine. Don't, don't worry about it. I, there's you... like a bookshelf. I could have books behind me like you do. I look like a real professor. <laughs> I don't care, honestly. It's fine. But, okay. what, what is the talos of this institute? Oh, that, glad you asked. So its mission is to connect the resources of the gay academy with the church as a whole. So they do a lot of public engagement. They run a journal called the Church Life Journal, which I highly recommend. Um, it's it's got great stuff, um, and it's online, and it has a really high high readership as well. Um, so that's one thing they do. They um, but what run are the very resources that they are sharing. These <laughs> the highly uh, refined Catholic minds is that. What <laughs> Yeah, basically, I think it's like, you know, what, what are, how can Catholic academ academics actually okay. help people outside the ivory tower? Okay. You know, so mm -hmm. rather than just, oh, here's my presentation I'm giving to other academics, or here's my article that 10 other academics will read, that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. the idea is that, you know, higher education is really important. There's a lot of in-depth learning that happens, but that learning only really matters insofar as it actually helps the, the broader church and not just the academy. So, so out of the tower into the streets. That's, yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and that suits me well because I like to write for a broader audience. You know, I don't particularly um, like to just do capital S scholarship. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because the academy broadly construed owes part of its existence and part of its form to the church, specifically That's the correct. Catholic church. I don't That's know correct. the academic legacy of, let's say the East, the Byzantine or the, um, the Greek Orthodox, but mm -hmm. I do know that Catholicism in the West monasteries mm -hmm. and a lot of the formal stuff and the yeah. pomp and circumstance actually can trace etymologically back to you know, the form that was enshrined within the church. So yeah, now totally. That the, I mean, yep. Now that the Academy went secular and then mm -hmm. it, there was this magic secular period and now it's gone uh, evangelical with what we call wokeness or whatever mm -hmm that stuff is. I don't know your preferred language for that. It's nice that you guys are also kind of doing that, um, kind of putting the academy rubber meets the road kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. Exactly. Yeah. And so how does the church benefit from scholarship? <sighs> well, or how does the, the, the hmm. normie, I guess the normie, uh, <laughs> Parishioner, is that the right term for? A yeah. So yeah, a parishioner would be like someone in the parish. So for example, the Institute also does a lot of um, kind of de like faculty development work for Catholic educators. So in that way, it helps Catholic strengthen Catholic schools. It, yeah. You know, by, um, so for example, there's like a science and religion initiative that McGrath does. And I was involved in that for the last couple of weeks. And you would have science educators from all over the United States coming for like a week long 
seminar experience where they're getting a lot of amazing content. They're also actually doing kind of lab work together, you know, and so they're, they're becoming better teachers um, and they're here at Notre Dame and getting, you know, so that's, that's some of the stuff that we do. Um, But I mean, basically like, so when I think of how I might fit into this, right. Like I have this, this background in women's and gender studies. Mm -hmm. So I, I know that world. Um, And so I guess I see what I can do is to basically be a bridge between that world and the general person, right. Who's, you know, maybe, maybe a Catholic school teacher who's trying to figure out, like, I don't really know how to, you know, navigate all this new gender stuff in my classroom or, um, why is, you know, what are the roots of this happening? Right. So I think, I think our, our kind of our polarized culture, there's so much reactionary stuff happening, right. People responding reactively to things. And um, so I'm hoping that my work can bring some of the, I guess the, the insider knowledge that I have in order to help people understand and navigate what's going on a little bit better. Um, Because I I do think that what's happening with gender is happening so rapidly and it's so confusing. There's so much linguistic confusion, first of all. So it's very hard to navigate. And so I just kind of want to empower parents and teachers and people with a little bit more of a grasp of kind of what the landscape is. And Mm -hmm. so say when they have a kid who comes up and says, you know, I think I'm trans, they're not going to be like, oh my God, I don't know what to do, you know, but rather like, oh, wow. Okay. Like I kind of maybe have a sense of how to respond in a, um, in a non-panicked way. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, Anyway, so that's kind of my hope. That's what I want to do is to, to do some kind of bridge building work. Mm -hmm. We'll see. I'm just thinking of like a Catholic school girl, um, preteen teen um, who is in this environment, the Catholic environment, which is very, there is a gender, it's a gendered space. It's a gendered (laughs) institution Yeah, from the very top to the, you know, to, to the ground. And um, some, some young girl like seeing that and then navigating all these expectations and this formality that's put on her and then also uh, emerging sexuality from within and then also Mm -hmm. sexual attention from without. And then there's this gender stuff that gets to allow her to obfuscate and, Mm -hmm. and, and, and separate and disassociate and then deal with other kind of issues and I'm wondering, have you meditated on that? And I do have to plug your book because it's phenomenal, The Genesis oh, of thanks. Gender. <laughs> I, I, I didn't get to finish it. I'm on the gender chapter, but there's a lot of stuff that I want to talk to you mm-hmm. about with it. Okay. But I just wanted to like root the conversation maybe in like the practicality of mm-hmm. this imaginary Catholic schoolgirl who mm-hmm. discovers gender ideology and mm-hmm. how would the church or a representative of the church talk her down from that ledge or give mm-hmm. her insight into how the church uh, uses gender from the yeah. highest to the lowest? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. So I, I feel very comfortable in the kind of theological and philosophical analysis of this stuff. Yeah. And when it comes to the practical relational, where the most important work happens, you know, that's something I want to actively really understand better, you know, and I've, mm-hmm. I've been listening to a lot of your interviews that you have with people that I think are so helpful. I've been listening to um, Stella O'Malley and uh, Sasha. I can't remember. Sasha. Sasha. Yes, yeah. of course. Um, you know, I think that's a wonderful resource, their approach. So, um, and well, you, you can, yeah. you can speak philosophically and then I can translate that because I'm, I'm in. <laughs> no, I'm, I mean, I do. I do training. think like, I mean, what, what I think is happening is that, a wide range of adolescent experiences and distress are being funneled into this kind of sausage factory that makes it about one thing and offers one simplistic solution, right? So I think the first response to, you know, a a gender questioning teen is curiosity, you know, trying to figure out, just to ask real questions about, oh, wow, tell me more about that. Like what, 
tell me more about your experience. And um, when did you begin thinking this way? And when you use this term, what do you mean by it? You know, just trying to kind of understand um, what's happening. And, and I think especially being attentive to the desires that there, there are a wide range of very good and real desires that could be pulling a young person toward um, what I call the gender paradigm, or, you know, some people call it gender ideology. You know, it could be a longing for community. It could be a longing um, for oneness with their body, for feeling that kind of body soul integration that, you know, as a Catholic, that's kind of our anthropology, our view of the human person. Mm -hmm. So a longing for that feeling of incarnation. Um, So these are all really good things, you know, but I think the problem is that the gender paradigm is it, it, it plays on those desires without actually being able to fulfill them and to truly meet them. Right. So I think being curious, paying attention to desire. And I also think in Catholic spaces as well as elsewhere, but since we're talking about Catholic spaces like schools, I think it's really important to be, to articulate a positive vision of both masculinity and femininity, because I think right now we have, really unpleasant narratives about what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman in our culture. Like I've been struck by some of the the male detransitioners that you've been interviewing recently that talk about how, you know, being a white male, like a predatory white male is like the worst thing you could possibly be and just wanting to kind of opt out of that, right? Like, so there's this narrative about what it means to be a man that's that's fundamentally negative. Mm. Um, and, you know, how, how can you kind of go through puberty, right? Become, how could you go through that process of becoming a man without a positive vision of what that could look like? And then the flip side of that, I think, is that um, for women, what it, for young women, like what it means to be a woman increasingly looks like this kind of hypersexualized, you know, pornified sex object, right? And I think so many young people are exposed to pornography so early that, that I think that we had these like pornified narratives about what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman. Hmm. And so I think we need to have positive articulations of yeah. manhood and womanhood that are also very um, roomy that have like, are very capacious that have room for diversity among women, diversity among men Yeah. Um, that aren't these like cookie cutter, you know, like Barbie Ken kind of garbage. So I think that in, in a Catholic space, the, yeah the saints like the motley crew of all the different kinds of saints we have who are almost all of them are super weird and countercultural yeah. and, yeah, and you die know, horrifically you, too you know they, you've, single one. you've got these like you know kind of gentle beggar men you've mm. got like joan of arc and hildegard of bingen right so you have so many saints who are you know gender Romans. non-conforming so to speak yeah okay. who basically are like showing that what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman can look differently as long as, I mean, that the, the most important thing is that we're, you know, we're following the call to like give and receive love. And like, there's a way that men embody that and that women embody that just because of the kinds of beings we are that might be different. But so I think that's something that that's a resource that Catholic schools could draw upon just having a lot of different kinds of female role models um, for women and a lot of different kinds of role models for men so that no matter what the kind of personality or how gender typical they are or are not, they still feel like there's a place here for me. And I don't need to, I don't need to reject my sex because I, I see how I can be a man here. I see how I can be a woman here. Yeah. In, in your, in your book and you draw upon one theme that I'm getting or one source that I'm getting is John Paul II's work on, um, on, on this area that he Mm -hmm. published a few decades ago. Um, Mm -hmm. he was the Pope before the, he's like two popes ago. Yeah. Yeah. And he, he was a long long Pope too. (laughs) Long Pope. Yeah. Yeah. Like, um, yeah, a long time. Um, so he died in 2005. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I don't know when he exactly, he, his work seems very prescient about um, speaking about the body and Mm -hmm. sex and the purpose of that. And um, it's very attractive. There's this, uh, I just found today, you mentioned something called personalism or personism. Mm -hmm. And I actually looked into one of the 
founders of that. And he, he actually, one of the guys I can never, it's just some German dude, Brecht or something like that. Some German dude. It's always yeah. a German dude. Scheller. She, she, <laughs> but he influenced Schiefenhofer. he influenced all of phenomenology and he mm-hmm. based everything on this con- concept of love and mm-hmm. um when you bring up one way that you try to bridge this gap with gender um is and and you talk about feminism you talk about um the way that feminism has tried to conceptualize the female and there's this current of liberalism that is kind of atomizing us but what you say are some very they're rich concepts there's this body soul thing that's integrated like we are Mm -hmm. every single one of us is actually an incarnation of a human or the incarnation Mm -hmm. of the soul so there is this physical body but the physical body is always representing a a Mm -hmm. spiritual reality which it it, and that language is not salient for a lot of materialists Mm -hmm. or uh, sure yeah so how do you how do we uh broaden that or deepen that understanding Hmm. of um the body and the soul and how that mm-hmm. can actually help us with the sexedness of our bodies, which I think is just kind of a mystery and something mm-hmm. that we're always going to be fascinated with and are always going to have to negotiate um, mm-hmm. because it's so personal and so universal at the same time. Yeah. 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 John Paul II in the, I think in the late seventies had a series of homilies um, that he gave on what's now called the, now it's kind of the collection, the collection of these homilies is called the theology of the body, Mm. but they're, they're really these really rich theological and philosophical meditations on passages of scripture. So like Genesis, song of songs, some of the gospels, these things, parts of scripture that deal very explicitly with the body and especially our sexual nature. So some of the, some of the things he highlights in, in the theology of the body is the sacramentality of the body. So basically the body, there's like our, there's our personhood or kind of our spiritual personhood that um, is only able to be kind of accessed or revealed to other people through the frame of our embodiment. Right. So this, the idea, the way he puts it is like the body reveals the person. So, and it's always doing that. Right. Um, And I think there's something interesting that, Hmm. uh, you kind of have that that idea in a slightly twisted form, I think, in some in some trans narratives, or, or at least a desire for that, like a desire for the body to reveal the person. Like my body doesn't reveal my person, and so I need to change my body in order for it to really reveal who I am. So I think the desire for that and the longing for that is a very real, almost this kind of desire for that sacramentality, right? But I think that I think mm. the mistake is in, is in not realizing that your your body doesn't have to be changed to do that. It's not something you do. It's something that your body is always doing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so there's there's definitely this, I think, um, high regard for embodiment, uh, which I think a lot of people, you know, who who aren't Christian, you know, have a perception of Christianity as being very anti-body and dualist and da, da, da. And certainly there have been many iterations of, yeah. and forms of Christianity where that's been the case. But I think certainly in, um, in Catholic Christianity and theology, the body really matters and it matters on kind of all levels because you've got, you've got these central mysteries of the faith, like the incarnation of Christ and the resurrection, but then you also have sacramental worship, like the Catholic view of the Eucharist. You know, we really think like we're eating Jesus's body (laughs) when we go to mass. Right. So we're, we're taking that, that divine body into our own body. And that is, is causing a very real process of transformation or divinization. Hmm. Um, Theosis, you know, it's, it's, it's given different theological names, but so the body really matters. Um, the body is not, yeah. That, and and every human being is a unity of body and soul. Um, so you, it's not this like ghost in the machine kind of idea. Which uh, it's funny, guys. I I taught at a Christian school for for over a decade, but a lot of my students who were raised in various forms of Christianity had a, a pretty gnostic idea that. Like, oh, well, when we die and go to heaven, it's just like, we're like these little Casper ghosts or something up there, you know? And I'm like, what about the resurrection, you know? Like for for yeah, Christians, well, like- What about the resurrection? You know, bodies matter. 
Well, I mean, for, for Christian, for in Christian theology, you know, I believe in the resurrection of the dead. Like, so there will be a time when, um, so like at death, like basically what death is, is the separation of um, body and soul. And that's what kind of destroys an organism, right? Because that's, hmm. that's death. That's what's destructive is that separation. And so the belief in the resurrection is that um, eventually there will be a restoration there, a, reun a reunion of the soul with the body and that the soul without the body is like an unnatural kind of state for it oh. or an incomplete state for it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Bernard of Clairvaux, this um, medieval um, theologian monk guy, he, he has these amazing writings on love, but one of the things he, he talks about is that the soul, like that the soul that's waiting for its body is like, is longing for its body. Like, even though it's in a state of bliss in the beatific vision, like the soul is longing for reunion with its body hmm. um, because that's, that's what it means to be a human being, right? Human beings aren't body, bodiless souls where, um, or body soul unities, I mm -hmm. guess we are our bodies. Yeah. And they matter. There's a crossover here and maybe, maybe we should ground the conversation in, in some sort of biography of you and how you mm -hmm. got into one. I know you wrote a book about your faith and, and mm -hmm. going Catholic. <laughs> um, but you also have a journey with feminism mm -hmm. and going feminism and then working outside of that. And it's really fascinating because there's one, one of the um, reasons I got into this entire gender debate was because it's the same, the same stuff that's happening with like race is happening in gender, but gender's a little bit more important to me than race. Race is kind of just mm -hmm. stupid, but the same sort of political um, thrust postmodernism and activism and like weird, strange kind of reconfigurations of, Marxism are active across all gender and race and not so much class because that confuses the powers that be. Um, but which is ironic, right? Like how unmarxist, how unmarxist of you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. These boutique beliefs. Um, but still with, with gender, what you see, especially in middle-class affluent young folk right now, they're ingesting these ideas about gender and becoming really confused and they're already dissociated from their body by our modern world. And mm -hmm. kind of there's something about liberalism and the assumptions of liberalism that do lead to a path of kind of separation and disapparation and fragmentation and gender's very personal when, when it happens yeah. in gender mm -hmm. societally with race and other kind of class dynamics or group dynamics is very destructive for the body politic, but gender actually is destructive to the, the body. Mm -hmm person. So, um, why Catholicism? What was that <laughs> thread? Oh man, such a weird story. Yeah. Um, so I, so I, I was raised an evangelical Protestant in the Western United States. So I kind of grew up inside an evangelical bubble inside like a 90s, Mormon bubble. 80, 90s, 2000s. I was born in 80, 83. Okay. Yeah. So I grew yeah, I would have been in the nineties. Um, youth grouper, Go on, like, yeah, trips I mean, and stuff. you know, I mean, I, I had kind of like a, a little bit of a, a sad experience <laughs> because I also lived in these small Mormon towns. So there wasn't a lot of us. So, yeah, I, you know, it was, I, you know, I never had the like mega church experience or like the huge youth group kind of thing. Like, um, uh, but so I think in that, uh, that upbringing, um, there are, there are kind of weird narratives about um, gender, right? So there's it's not clear if, that there's much of a role for women in the church to do anything except kind of you know, set coffee. up the potluck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, set up the potluck, you know, and be a wife and a mother. There's this expectation that everyone will get married. And if you don't, you're just sad. Um, and that that's kind of the, the, best, the best option for women. That's the goal. Um, and... I think that, and there are certain parts of my personality that are like, that are feminine and some that aren't, you know, I think, especially as a young person, I was really sporty, sporty spice, kind of a jock. 
um, competitive. You know, I, I had these traits that didn't seem to fit the evangelical understanding of femininity. And so I think that kind of raised questions of gender in my head from an early age. So then I went to college. I went to an evangelical school. Um, Pardon me, asking yeah. or interrupting, was there a reality to your faith? Like, you know, I know like socially, maybe it just mm-hmm. you know, fit in that, but was there like a reality? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I think there was there was a sincere sense of faith. I mean, I think it was... It, it wasn't very examined. I mean, which makes sense. I mean, just developmentally, right. Mm-hmm. You kind of grow up, but I did have, I think, I think my whole life I've had an attentiveness to the noumenal world, I guess, and mm-hmm. a sense of, of spirituality and a sense of God. Um, and I don't think I've ever lost that, even though that's taken different forms over the years. Uh, so yeah, I, I kind of, I kind of, you know, when I was a teenager, I kind of did the like, you know, like mess around and like rebel and then like come back to Jesus in the summer when you go on like the little (laughs) mission trip, you know, it was that kind of a thing. And then I was like, oh, I've been so bad, you know, I promised Jesus it won't happen again. You know, I'd get like rebaptized constantly, you know, that sort of thing. (laughs) Um, But yeah, so I went to college and um, that's, you know, in college is when, I think for me, questions of identity and purpose and the future become pressing. And, Mm -hmm. and that was the first time I encountered feminist theology and feminist biblical criticism. And it really appealed to me because I thought, oh, this is what I've been looking for. You know, I've, I really wanted a sense of a richer sense of like, what does it mean to be a woman? What does that look like? And, and to have that, that dignity um, of my womanhood be affirmed in a, in a real way. And, and so I thought, yes, feminism will provide this. And there are different strains of feminism. There's feminisms, yes. as you say, and mm-hmm. as I've said. Right. Um, and one, I could see how one section of it th- is critical of the mm-hmm. uh, denigration of women throughout various traditions and stuff. So there yeah. can be an empowerment that's linked directly to being against yes. stuff, which is, which is liberatory up to a point. Um, so did, was that attractive to you that kind of. So initially I think there are kind of two, two sort of phase, two waves, if you will. I'm just kidding. <laughs> of my, <laughs> of my, of my feminist undergrad years. But um, the first one, I think I was very much an evangelical feminist or like an egalitarian feminist. Right. So my approach was, Oh, well, I still took scripture seriously. I still had like a sense of, you know, God is real and Jesus is real and Jesus saves. And um, we just need to, we, the Bible matters. We just need to learn to interpret it correctly. So it was much more hermeneutical. It was like, let's look at this tricky passage about women not speaking in church. Like, what are the Greek words? What does that really mean? What's the context, right? So doing that kind of making hermeneutical arguments um, for kind of an egalitarian feminist position. But then eventually a shift happened where I think I adopted much more the hermeneutics of suspicion, right? Which is, I think what you were describing, which is much more like, no, actually we shouldn't take the Bible seriously because it's a patriarchal text. It was written by men. Mm -hmm. It's demeaning to women. Our very concept of God is patriarchal and demeaning to women. We should avoid masculine language for God. So basically this, this deep seated kind of suspicion toward Christianity as a whole, toward the tradition, toward scripture, toward theology, toward language, toward, you know, um, and so I think that when that shift happened, I think what ha- I think what happens when you adopt a hermeneutics of suspicion toward a religion is that it pushes you outside the religion, really, because you can't so so much of I think the religious sensibility is a disposition of trust and of surrender, you know, and reliance upon something greater than yourself. That doesn't have to be an unthinking kind of trust, but nonetheless trust. And so I think when I began to be suspicious in this kind of writ large way, I no longer really trusted um, anything when yeah. it came to Christianity, except myself. I trusted myself. <laughs> and your rationality, yeah. your tools and, and Yeah, your just, ability. you know, I just knew everything, you know, well, like, yeah. <laughs> like, oh, I'm super smart and I'm like 20, you know, I have a college degree. <laughs> 
like I can I can read the Bible and know what you know what it really mm. means anyway. Sorry, I'm I'm being a little uncharitable to well, myself, like I, you know. But there is something about the kind of you know the hubris of being like 20 years old and thinking like, oh, I've you know I've now assessed this 2,000 year old tradition and decided that it's garbage, you know, without really studying it in a meaningful way. Mm-hmm. Um, Anyway, so then I went on to, so I got an undergrad degree in philosophy and I got really interested in feminist philosophy. And then I um, was also interested in literary studies. I just love everything. I can't decide. So I went on in graduate school. You're and perfect math. fertile ground for postmodernism. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Philosophy and yes. literature. And, and by the time suspicion. I graduated from college, I was a thoroughgoing postmodernism, right? Postmodernist. So I still considered myself a Christian, but in the sense that Well, Christian, there's, there are many different narratives and Christianity is one of many, but I think it's the most, you know, the most compelling one to kind of try to understand reality, Hmm. but everything's metaphorical. So um, I didn't have a sense of, I mean, that's, what's interesting about Christianity is it makes some very like real historical claims that like, you kind of have to reckon with like, and either be on board or not. Right. So I was like, it kind of sweeping that aside a little bit and being like, yeah, like incarnation, resurrection, those are beautiful concepts that we can like think theoretically about blah, 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 which is great. It's great headspace to be in when you're in graduate school. Cause that's all you're doing all the time. Right. You're like, let me take a theoretical lens mm. and like read a text through this lens. Um, so that's what I was doing with feminist theory and gender theory. So I did a, I did a master's in women writing and gender, my PhD is in English, um, but it's all in, um, French feminist philosophy yeah. applied to contemporary women's novels. Irrigure. Um, Irrigure. Yes. Loose. Irrigure. Loose. Well, I mean, you should say it. Irrigure. But Irrigure. who has time for that? <laughs> who has time for that? Like, that's she, too hard. You know, so I, I spoke so with I the, say Irrigure, even though I know that's Irrigure. the crass American way of saying it. Yes. Is she the... <laughs> is she the um, I don't know. There's this, I'm really sorry to go here, but it, it just keeps on occurring when I speak about feminism, but like, there's this obsession with the vulva and like, like deifying it and stuff. And I think that Irigiri did a lot of like the theoretical work about making the ways of being, there's just, there's a very, and I think you mentioned this in your book. Um, she's, her writing is trying to bring a sensuality to, to conceptuality mm-hmm. and you know there's a lot of like mucosal yes. and <laughs> you know it's like slugly things going on in her language and stuff so it's very like it sounds like she's trying to be like trying to be very vaginal whereas the, as opposed to the male the the phallic masculine hetero way of thought and i'm just wondering if that's a yeah so, yeah, so I think French, when I say French feminism, obviously there's a huge range, but when I'm talking about kind of the big three, like Hélène Sixou, Lucie Rigoré, and Julia Kristeva, and I focused mainly on Rigoré. But yes, I think and these are postmodernist uh, 80s, 90s uh, yes, aughts so, yeah, thinkers. Yeah, yeah. Post, post-structuralist, yeah. So, post-structuralist. Um, okay. They, uh, let's see. So, especially in Sixou and Rigoré, there very much is this high regard for the body and the way that um, just having a female body will change your experience of the world and maybe even the things that you value. Um, there is a an often anthologized essay by Arie Gray. I think it's called like When Our Lips Speak Together or something like that, which I think is often interpreted as just being about the vulva, but actually I think she's doing something more complex there. But um, doing something yeah. more complex there. She's French. Yes, exactly. Right. So um yeah. Uh, but I, you know, I like a Rigoré. I still do. Uh, well, and, why? Yeah. Because of the poetic or because of the, like, what, what's so the content? Her, her main argument, her yeah. main argument is that we, our culture has never really seriously conceptualized sexual difference. Yeah. What has happened, we, we essentially have a monoculture where you have everything that's kind of centered on this masculine ideal. And then the feminine is almost this like weird kind of shadow mirror image of that. Mm -hmm. So she was saying like, we, we need to begin to think not in terms of one, but of two and to have, to really develop, you know, um, a feminine subjectivity or a subjectivity in the feminine as she kind of describes it, that might not look like a subjectivity in the masculine. So she's, 
she sees sexual difference as both real and positive, but also still not fully realized in the sense of our mm. kind of philosophical imagination. Hmm. And so I, I think as a feminist, even though I knew I wasn't supposed, I was supposed to hate essentialism, right? That's like this cardinal sin as a feminist. I always had a sense of like, yeah, men, men and women are different. Like it, it's different to be a woman than it is to be a man, you know? And it's also cool to be a woman and there are parts that are hard, but I like it. You know, I like being a woman and I, um, I wanted to understand that more. Mm. Right. Um, so I, I like that Arigare took sexual difference seriously while also realizing the ways in which our culture has interpreted sexual difference in simplistic, sometimes misogynist ways. Mm -hmm. So, um, but it, yeah, it's, it's, it sounds yeah. like her project was a positive move toward the mm -hmm. feminism rather than just a right. suspicious move away from the masculine. Yep. Yep. And, yes. and, and, um, so, so there's that, but also a non Butlerian, I'm just going to destroy the entire thing. Yes, is exactly. Uh, exactly. She's not post-structuralist in terms of everything's now deconstructed no. infinitely. Okay. No, no, because she, she takes the body seriously. She also has a psychoanalytic streak, which, you know, sometimes that stuff can go a little bit, you know, a little wild, but the nice thing about psychoanalysis is that it takes embodiment and developmental, yeah. you know, it developmental, like embodied developmental experiences seriously, which I think really matter. Um, and what was yeah. your reaction to Butler coming across Butler in your, in your, um, in your formative? Okay, so let me see if I can remember years. my first time reading. I think I first read Judith Butler in graduate school when I was doing the gender master's degree, gender theory. Um, and I, I mean, I didn't like that. I didn't like how ruthlessly deconstructive she was, right? I didn't like the idea of female not being meaningful, right? Like that, that really, this is like a- It's all a game. It's all- Yeah, or that, that this is actually a harmful idea that we need to actively deconstruct. I did think her- her idea of performativity was interesting. Um, you know, there is something to that. There is something to the idea that we unconsciously embody and enact social scripts related to gender. That I'm sure is true. But I think she takes it to the extent that gender is only that. It is only the unconscious embodiment of a social script that creates the illusion of an essence. Whereas I want to say, no, there's a there there. Mm -hmm. Like you can, you know, there's something yeah. real that's being expressed. Whereas Butler's like, no, it's just the expression that's real. So, um, yeah, well, I mean, I, I not I, even yeah. real, just interpreted as real. Exactly. <laughs> real. I mean, real and <laughs> yeah, hmm. you know, I actually had a dream about Judith Butler last night. I've had a couple of dreams about her and like, it's, she's always fun to hang out with. She's just super chill. Huh. Like we were, we were like sharing a recliner and like reading books and like talking about books. Oh, <laughs> isn't that weird? I'm like, I don't know what that's about. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. So maybe it's like, I, you know, I, I, it's funny. Like I disagree with Butler, but I don't feel like a sense of animus toward her or anything, but um, it's so funny when I have these random dreams about her, I'm like, what is, what is the deal? Like, what does she represent in my subconscious? I don't know. That's yeah. fascinating. I wonder what she And the recliner. Say. What does the recliner mean? Well, the reading of the books. Um, <laughs> maybe it was some sort of prep for this conversation. Um, in some yeah, maybe. Way. I mean, I, I am talking about her a lot. <laughs> Let's be clear. You know, yeah. if you talk about gender, you talk about Butler. Yeah. I, we, I, I want to go back to the biography, but I just, um, just wanted to plug... I, I do think that there is a there there with gender and uh, what I'm trying to, I'm trying to conceptualize and I'm using as my foil gender critical radical feminism. And I, mm -hmm. I don't think gender critical radical feminism is entirely mapped out yet. I think it's more of a, it's kind of a club of people just kind of basically mm -hmm. trying to deconstruct. I appreciate your formula gender, gender paradigm. They're, they're trying to mm -hmm. save women's sports. They're trying to save the mm -hmm. definition of woman. But when they define woman, it's adult human female. 
It's mm-hmm. like, well, no, there's not, there's a woman there. There's something about woman. If we call adult human female, if we say that a woman is an adult human female, why would you be mad that we're calling her a cervix haver or a menstruator? Like there's this, mm-hmm. they want to have, they want to criticize the cake and have it too. It seems like, so I'm trying to like hmm. figure out how to describe woman and man in a way that is holistic. And I think that you have some clues in what you're bringing up with personhood. And Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, even though it's a little dangerous, I like using flirtation as like Mm -hmm. a basic kind of like understanding. This is a fun kind of field uh, to Mm -hmm. navigate and negotiate and test each other and become Mm -hmm. de-anonymized, not just intimate, but de-anonymized through some sort of playing with gender roles. So maybe I can even Mm -hmm. incorporate Butler at some point, but I just wanted to say that I think we're kind of on the same page or you're very much helping me in trying to conceptualize these, these matters, but Catholicism. So (laughs) Catholicism (laughs) question mark. Yeah. So it's such a weird story. I still don't, I still can't even, I look back, I'm like, what the heck for me? Like the only way to explain it is literally just God kind of like shooting me with an arrow Okay. and being like, you're, you know, you're going to be Catholic. Okay. But, um, but w- where did that arrow come f- yeah, from? Yeah, exactly. Like, okay, a, like so, a stained glass yeah, window yeah. that you're, did you trip on like some sort of sprinkler and there was like a <sighs> Eucharist wafer there? You're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So my twenties, postmodern feminism, that was my religion. Toward the end of my 20s, um, several, I guess, I had escalating crises that sort of converged into this perfect storm, the result of which was my Catholicization. (laughs) Uh, So Mm. one of those was an an escalating spiritual crisis, right? Because I was still I was I was still trying to hold on to this like very nominal, like contentless Christianity um, and Why? I was working it in because it was a good framework. It was just the background rate. Right, I mean, I would... think, like I mentioned before, you know, I think I've always had kind of a an attention to um, spirituality and religion, and like I had a hunger. I had a hunger for the deeper meaning yeah. and the sacred. That's a great way to put it. I had a hunger for the sacred, and I there were things about Christianity I thought were very beautiful, especially the idea of incarnation. But that's the problem. I thought of it as only an idea, even though incarnation itself is an idea that <laughs> signals something that is more than an idea, i.e. embodied. But anyway, mm-hmm. um, so I basically came to, I, I so I had been living in cognitive dissonance for a long time. And I basically came to, that came to a head where I was like, kind of had a like shit or get off the pot moment you know it's like look either i'm either i'm gonna either i'm a christian and i need to take that seriously and maybe i don't know pray once in a while or like practice it in some way so how how did you what was what was precipitating this like was it i'm sorry to interrupt you was like anxiety mounting anxiety was it like a um, disassociation from reality like what what was the no it wasn't that intense pressure was there a pressure on it, or was it just like you? You just kept on like your brain was like, I'm using this formula, but I'm not using this formula, kind of. Like. So I mean, I think what was bringing the pressure was the fact that I was teaching at a Christian institution. Okay. So I was at a Christian university where you know you're supposed to be like spiritually forming your students, and here I have like no meaningful spiritual life to talk to to speak of, and that means that I'm going to be kind of phoning it in even sort of not an outright lying, but at least like fudging it, you know, and eventually I just became really uncomfortable with that. So I, I kind of was like, look, I can't. And so I thought I need to look for other jobs. Right. So I was like, I want to apply to other jobs because I don't really know if I'm a Christian or not. I need to figure this out. Right. I've just been kind of, I've been straddling the fence for too long. I need to figure this out. I either need to be honest with myself and be a good agnostic, or I need to like actually try and you know, have a real faith life. So, and then at the same time, in the same kind of period of my life, I became a mother for the first time. And that really rocked my world. Um, Namely, it kind of began to disrupt my very like tidy and closed feminist worldview. Um, Because part of it was, um, the experience of pregnancy. And I had an ultrasound pretty early because there was something wrong with the cord. 
And so I had an ultrasound at the 12th week, which you normally don't. And it's a great time to have an ultrasound because the baby's small enough that you can see the whole body on the screen, not just like, oh, there's a leg, I guess, you know, it's like the whole, and it was like, it didn't look like a weird fish creature. It was like a freaking baby, like gorgeous baby. You could see his brain. It looked like cauliflower, you know, and he was just like, he was sucking his thumb. He was kicking. He was just like going all over the place. It was like, and it, that shocked me because it was only, it was in the first trimester. This was 12 weeks, first trimester. And I just thought like, you know, I just couldn't unsee that, you know, and that happened to coincide with um, Wendy Davis's uh, protest in the Texas legislature about abortion at the time. It was a big news story. And so what was the um, content of that briefly? I don't really remember okay. except that there was, Pro some, or she, or something? she was, yeah. So she's a pro-choice politician. She was filibustering some kind of bill. And so I was, you know, like I was on Twitter at the time and like um, watching all this like feminist commentary on it, you know, and then all of a sudden it was the kind of like tweet your abortion thing. And, mm. and there was a, a writer that I followed who I think she tweeted something like, Oh, I feel left out. Cause I haven't had an abortion, you know? And I, and I just think like that, that just like, left to be cold in a way like I couldn't again I think I'd been you know living in a little bit of cognitive dissonance of like mm-hmm. yes I'm a good feminist I'm pro-choice pro-abortion and yet like I'm confronted with the very real and very alive humanity of my first trimester kid <laughs> you know um and you know and then I gave birth to a son which I I think when I first became pregnant I was like oh it'll be a girl and I'll name her Gloria Steinem, you know, it'll be great. <laughs> and then like, you know, once I was the mother to a son, I was like, I just became interested in the male experience in a way that I hadn't, you know, I mean, I think the experience of motherhood pulls you out of yourself. And if I'm honest, I think my feminism, my feminist worldview was a little solipsistic. It was a little bit like narrowly focused on issues that only affected women and yeah. women who looked like me, you know? So Um, now it wasn't like I suddenly went like full tread anti-feminist or anything, but it was just enough to kind of disrupt, um, I guess my, I think I'd become an, an ideologue and that I began to ask questions that I hadn't asked before. I also like weirdly, this is kind of a side thing that you'd be interested in, um, just because of what you do, but this was back in like 2013 and I used to have this blog and. Um, and there was one post I, I wrote and I was also writing for the Atlantic online and I, I wrote several pieces on sexual violence, uh, male victims of sexual violence. And for some reason that got me on the radar of some men's Memories, rights activists. Yeah. yeah. And but I had this really interesting email correspondence with one of them, actually several of them. And one of, you know, one of them, for example, who had like um, kind of posted some mean stuff. And then I kind of clarified something he said. And then he, then all of a sudden he was like really nice. And he was like, I'm sorry, I just was venting. And he's, then it turns out he's like a victim of child sexual abuse. And he's just so frustrated because there's like no resources for male victims of sexual violence. It's all, you know, kind of caught up in this simplistic narrative about only, you know, women are victims and men are predators. And, Mm -hmm. and so these, just, I think, recognizing the humanity of people who I had really seen as subhuman was also something that I just, my world was opening up a bit. Um, so that was, that was another kind of the, um, the movements that were, that were happening. And then in that situation, I just kind of very quickly became Catholic. Um, <laughs> still, <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm sorry. There's not like this easy answer. But like, I wasn't going to mass. I didn't know any Catholics. I don't have Catholics in my family. Like, I don't get it now. But I still had my, I still had some feminist objections for sure. Um, Contraception. The abortion one was actually easier to let go of, I think, because in some ways I had never really fully, you know, believed that that was just totally morally neutral or even laudatory. So, um, but the sexuality and marriage stuff was hard for me. That was the hardest thing to let go of um, or to have my, to kind of change my perspective. About, and but. by sexuality and marriage, you mean um, heterosexual, heteronormativity in the words of uh, academic fem- feminism and monogamy, like those two 
things as pillars I mean, or as the ideal or as the only way? Like, what's the objection? So basically, basically the um, the understanding that that sexual difference is integral to marriage, that marriage is actually a response to the reality of sexual difference and its life giving potential, like that. So yeah, I mean, you could put the the, the heteronormativity stamp on that if you, if you want to. Mm. Um, but I think that that was because I you know I had I had I had kind of a view of marriage that I think a lot of people in our culture do, which is just you know it's kind of a romantic union, you know, a committed romantic union between two adults and mm-hmm. end of story. Maybe you have kids, maybe you don't. Whatever, it's up to you. Um, so to kind of see it, to see marriage as actually connected to how we participate in the transmission of human existence. That was a big shift um, because it's just a very different understanding of marriage um, in terms of what it is and what its purpose is. Yeah. And that has ramifications for, I mean, I was married, right? So I was like, okay, like, how do I, how do I live this out? Like, how do I apply this to my own life? You know? And so there were some adjustments that had to be made. <laughs> <laughs> Someday um, your your yeah. dude's your dude's gonna write a book about it. <laughs> oh my gosh, he's such a good sport. <laughs> the yeah. the through line, the Catholic. I, I don't think it's like Catholic theology, but the the Catholic thinkers that I've been um, interacting with, Erica Bakuloki, um Mm-hmm. Mark Barnes and uh, Maria Brandel at New Polity. Mm-hmm. They did a big series on uh, the politics. Yeah, of they did. I, I listened to part of that. Yeah, it's a really big series. Um, mm-hmm. There's just there's a through line between, or there's a critique. A very it's just there's there's integrity. Like it's almost whole, and it goes from sexuality. Um, as a expression and as a drive and how do we deal with that drive to the reality of the body? How do we deal with this to the, the consequences of sexuality and how the consequences of sexuality being new life causes sexuality to have an entirely, a very big, powerful meaning. And then mm-hmm. marriage has a big, powerful meaning and man and woman have a big, powerful meaning. And again, okay. you walk into a church. I, I said this to Maria, you walk into a church that Mary's right there. Mary, mm-hmm. Mary's right. Mary's everywhere. You know, you're inside Mary. The, the church is a woman, <laughs> right? Yeah. There's like female bodies everywhere. The, 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 yeah. So, yeah. and, and they're, they're not just like the, 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 right. They're female bodies. Um, and that response to it, it speaks to sexual licentiousness in our culture. It speaks to uh, sex positivity, sex work, prostitution. Uh, it speaks to femininity. It really speaks to femininity in a way that is, I think, more empowering than any sort of empower, female empowerment that I've come across. Not that I'm a feminist. I just, I, I see the radiations. I see the behaviors of it um, radiating through the culture. And then also the transgender movement it it speaks directly to that and there's just there's something very appealing though very scary because it is very like okay you know if if you're gonna have to live this if you believe it's this, countercultural you know? man yeah that's i mean and that was the thing i realized after so i kind of like became i so something about my personality is like <laughs> what i when I decide to do something, I'm like, let's do it. You know, like, boom, let's do this now. And so I like became Catholic. And then I was like, oh, shit, what did I do? Like, <laughs> what did I sign up for? You know, and so it was actually the first couple of years being Catholic that I really began to work through some of my big questions. And um, and this is what, I, what years right, yeah. were these? Uh, in- I jo- so I became Catholic in Easter 2014. And then so this would have been. Game, 2015 game, yeah. okay. 2015 was the real big year i think um and i i think a big part of that was learning what you're describing that all of these things are interconnected uh because at first i wanted to just have my key, cake and eat it too i was like ooh, theology of the body i like this you know the sacramental meaning to womanhood this is beautiful this is this actually is the kind of rich meaning i've been looking for um but then that's connected to what marriage is. 
that's connected to how, you know, we all have to sacrifice when it comes to our sexual desires for the sake of love and, and um, Hmm. the reality of life, you know, and, and so realizing that basically it like, it comes as a piece, you know, and I think I'd done the cherry picking thing for so long that I was just like, all right, I'm going to do this. Like, I'm going to do this, you know? And, um, and then eventually I think the more I really read and thought deeply about the reasons behind what the church teaches and why she teaches what she does, especially about sexuality, the, the more I actually came to embrace it, not just kind of say, all right, well, you know, I guess I'll go along with it, but actually like, oh, there's real wisdom and beauty to Mm -hmm. be found here. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah. The thing about the Catholic church is uh, there's a, there's a, there's a, (laughs) there's a lot of ways you could finish that sentence. (laughs) I'm like, okay, here we go. (laughs) There's one, there's one, I I've interviewed several uh, or not plenty, um, several, maybe dozens of feminists and interacted with them. And there's different brands again. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did this very intense dual um, uh, interview with uh, American feminist Kara Dansky and uh, uh, British feminist Julie Bindel. And um, Mm -hmm. Julie Bindel is more socialist in nature, is more uh, materialist, more classist, more... uh, Feminism is about protecting women from sexual violence and from the economic disparity that comes part and parcel of sex. Carrie Dansky, more of American feminist, is that feminism is about giving women power. I'm I'm simplifying that, but it's more of... uh, more about how many women CEOs are there and why is that it's got to be the patriarchy kind of, kind of very, uh, very dim analysis. One of her weird, we got hung up on rape because she thinks that men need to stop raping. And I asked her how, and for about half an hour, she was like, you guys just need to stop. I'm like, well, how, how, how do you, how? Cause I haven't raped anybody in years. I like, I don't even remember ever raping anybody. So how am I, what, what do you want me? Anyway? So, but with Catholicism, like there's no pre, there's no female, there's no female CEO. It doesn't mm-hmm. seem like you guys are going to go in that direction. Um, mm-hmm. But there is, a, there is power in, there is positions of power for women and women do have power, it seems like. Um, and mm-hmm. it, not just in the convent sense, which is what I spoke with Maria about last week, mm-hmm. um, just like a complete absenting of the woman from the sexual. And there's not just the woman has to be a trad wife thing. It doesn't seem like that. It doesn't seem like you're a trad wife. I mean, you're a high-powered I'm not academic woman. So what high is... High-powered. <laughs> What is the? What, what, I can't what even is, get in my own office. Well, <laughs> Sorry, I, okay. I can make a sexist joke about that, but I'm not going to. Aw, uh, um, good for you. So when when you go into church and you have the you have your own um, kind of brand or version or experience of feminism, how do you adjust and then find like power? Um, if, if feminism is about power or feminism mm. is about helping women specifically, what does the Catholic church mm. offer? Ah, ooh, that's a great question. I mean, like, I think that's probably part of the, the mismatch, right. Is the preoccupation with power. Like, is that really what it's about? Um, well, justice, I, fairness, I, power, right. Isn't it all of a piece? Yes. But power is only, power is kind of a neutral thing. Like it's, it needs to be power to do what, right? So if if power isn't connected to the good, for example, then maybe it's not something, it it shouldn't be sought for its own sake, I guess I should say. Um, So one thing I've actually found surprising, especially coming from evangelicalism is how how much of a place women do have in the Catholic church in terms of certainly if you go into any parish, um, you know, on the parish council, many of the ministries, catechists running our CIA, like a lot of the time leadership, non-sacramental, like so non-ordained leadership 
um, women, women are in positions of non-ordained leadership. Um, you have women who are like vice chancellors of archdiocese and, you know, the highest, you know, women in, you know, in um, high, increasingly there's more space for women to have higher roles in the Vatican as well. Um, so administrative. So I, I think, kind of. yes, I think there's, I think more can be done there, honestly. So hmm. I am on board with, the very specific sacramental role of the priesthood being um, relegated to men. I think that there are, I don't want to really go into the weeds on that, but there are good theological reasons for that. But what I, what I don't think necessarily has to be the case is that the priesthood is also the kind of entire administrative body of the church. Right. So I think there's room for, reform that both protects the integrity of the priesthood, but then also allows women to have much more of a voice to speak in, um, to speak into the hierarchy. Um, but I think that also is happening more than people realize. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm on advisory councils for bishops, you know, things like, you know, I think even though you might say like, oh, the bishop's a man, but women are kind of speaking into the conversation in really meaningful ways. Like women are theologians, you know, women are professors, you know, women are mm -hmm. ministers. Um, and, and yeah. And this is a fraught question, but what do women bring? I mean, this is, this is a, hmm. the gender question. What do women bring that's unique to the church? Let's just say, or. That's a good question. Um, other than new life, what do women bring? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, and a nice thing about Catholicism as well is that there's also a rich tradition of women doing things other than getting married and, yeah. you know. Which so usually is dying is a, in some horrific fashion. Oh, but. come on. Most of those... <laughs> Most of those nuns lived till they were old, you know, like Hildegard, man. She died when she was like 90 or something, which is crazy for the Middle Ages. Anyway. But she was um, martyred at 90? Actually. She was not martyred. Okay. <laughs> not every, okay. You don't have <laughs> to be I'm martyred. Saying. Okay. Okay. No. Okay. The majority of Catholics are not martyrs. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's funny. Anyway. Okay. Well, I got to take a drink. All right. Um, what do women bring? So one one way that this is expressed sometimes in Catholic circles is the feminine genius, right? But the, the concept of the feminine genius, I think, is it comes from John Paul II's work, but also <laughs> Edith Stein, who's awesome, by the way, speaking of martyrs. So Edith Stein was a Jewish convert to Catholicism, a philosopher who trained under Husserl, I believe. <clears throat> Might want to fact check me on that one. So a phenomenologist, metaphysician. <laughs> And also was martyred in Auschwitz. So she's amazing. Oh, okay. um, but she, she has a series of essays on women. And I mean, so she basically, um, there's a lot of different angles. So I'm just trying to kind of get, gather my thoughts here. Yeah. Because of our different embodied experiences, there, there are just, that, that shapes our kind of understanding of the world and not in a way that is cartoonishly simplistic and not in a way that um, eradicates the differences between women, right? Mm -hmm. So one, one framework I think I, I like um, that Edith Stein uses is, is kind of thinking on of this question on sort of three levels because you have the human level. So men and women are both fully human. So if you think of the the range of human attributes and traits, personalities, inclinations, right? So there's all of that's kind of on offer for both men and women. Both, um, both men and women, there aren't like virtues that women have and virtues that men have, right? There are human virtues that men and women can um, mm habituate. And then there's the level of sexual difference. And on this level, men and women are different. And that's kind of rooted in, in the body, but the body also, it's, it's not just a bodily difference because sexual difference is also like you were talking about earlier, it's holistic. It has to do with the entire person. So there are, there are, you know, we have to think about sexual difference, not only in terms of biology, but also in terms of spirituality, hmm. psychology, 
you know, just all, um, even phenomenology, right. Kind of being and a human being a female body in the world and the kind of experience that brings because we are hmm. embedded in certain times and cultures. Right. So all of that will shape the person. So the, the bodily and biological differences are kind of the ground of that, but it's not the, it's not the only thing. Um, and then there's also the individual level. So this is an important one to keep where you, <coughs> you have and each individual, and this is kind of mind blowing. If you really think about it, like every individual human being is entirely unique. Like that's incredible. If you really just sit with that for a second, like that's amazing. If you, you know? really, like, if you really sit with it, it's kind of nauseating. It's like, whoa, <laughs> there's been trillions so, of us. Right. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's really, so it's kind of amazing to think like, okay, I'm a human being, I'm a woman, but I'm also like the only, the, the only, I'm the only kind of woman that is me, you mm -hmm. know, like I'm a entirely unique manifestation of womanhood. Mm -hmm. Right. And so my exact mix of personality traits and experiences, you know, won't will be, will be different from other women, but still there is something meaningful. There is something real. And I think everyone knows this. That's the thing. Like if you, if you walk, if you're the only woman in a room full of men, that's a different environment than if you're the only woman in a room full of women. Like you just, there's, it's just different, yeah. you know, yeah. like I, you can't reduce it to something super easy. Like here are the list of three traits that yeah, no, you know, yeah, separate yeah. men and women, but whatever. It's, it's like, a vibe. It's a, it's a grounding. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, and it's not, it's not necessarily like better or worse either. Like, frankly, I prefer, I feel more comfortable in, in male environments most of the time. Like, I kind of get a little bit freaked out when I'm at like women's spiritual retreats and there's oh. a lot of candles and like Kleenex boxes. I'm like, what are we doing? <laughs> you know, like, um, anyway, <laughs> right. So, there are ways in which like, yeah, you know, at yeah. the individual level, whatever, but nonetheless, yeah. I think huh. like if I'm gonna, you know, I'm talking about like, if I'm on these, you know, whatever advisory committees or something to a diocese or to a school um, and we're talking about gender or sexuality or sexual ethics, whatever, mm. I'm going to be able to bring um, knowledge that draws upon my experience as a woman that's different and not accessible to a man, you know, like, well, accessible through you. And yeah, directly accessible. Yeah. Right. So um, I think that's really important. I also think that um, I think that maybe one of the spiritual ramifications, I guess, of the fact that, you know, a woman is the kind of human being that can gestate life within her. Like there's something about being a woman that, um, that almost makes us guardians of the dignity of the human person and the dignity of human life. Like we're kind of the first we're, yeah, there's something. And so I think that doesn't mean we all like women naturally have this, um, this as a gift or something, but rather I think the idea of the feminine genius is a capacity that can be cultivated like yeah. any other virtue, right? Something that can be lived into. Yeah, right. Yeah. You bring up so, you bring yeah. up an excellent um, distinction when talking about sex and gender, um, about potentiality versus actuality, and mm -hmm. woman as one way to define or to answer the question, "What is a woman?" is to say, woman has the potential mm -hmm. to do this, and it's built into her yes. body, and yep. which is founded on life. And I just, mm -hmm. I don't know how to approach that um, without using symbolic language or without using poetic mm -hmm. language or mythopoetic mm -hmm. language, um, because it's just so profound that it needs to I be know. spoken of in, in a certain way. And a lot of what I'm trying to tease out about liberalism Certain assumptions that are call, called liberal is this individual subject, this atomized, individual, autonomous, willful, rational agent, which is one way of an analyzing culture and then setting up culture that can allow for more autonomy than other ways of, of conceiving of culture. But when you get to a woman, specifically the life-bearing woman, specifically the, the mother and the child up to a certain point in time that they're not two. They're not, they're not two. They are one 
and two. Mm -hmm. And and it's almost like this Trinity kind of thing. It's like this Mm -hmm. dyad where Mm -hmm. the liberal conception or the Western conception doesn't really, we don't honor that. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Right. I mean, the frame, the liberal framework of autonomy and individual rights it works within it a certain specific zone of exactly. having been educated, having been mm-hmm. raised, and then not yet going decrepit. So we have Joe Biden is on like the very, very edge of like right. the liberal <laughs> subject now right. popped up, and then and then the baby, an infant, a five year old. We we don't even know because mm-hmm. like there's all this thing we we have consent. Like, well, when can somebody? be consent mm-hmm. uh, consensual to get a tattoo get an ear piercing have sex mm-hmm. um decide to change their sex you know um yeah so how yeah. does and and i think that i i'm what i guess the question is like how does catholicism or some ideas within catholicism allow us to better conceptualize the woman as as something that adds to life and that therefore brings knowledge to us from that experience. Hmm. Well, I mean, I guess, I mean, I guess if you're like inside a Catholic understanding of reality, um, you have the significant, like there's temporal significance to things, right? So the phenomenon of pregnancy that has temporal meaning and that you create new human beings, you, you know, you help the species survive. What right? temporal you, meaning? This sounds like a technical term. I haven't come across it. Temporal, yet. just meaning like um, this, Actual. like the earth, earthly life. Okay. Okay. As yeah. temporal as opposed to eternal, maybe. Okay. Like, okay. But I think the difference, it's when the Catholic understanding of reality, there isn't just the temporal, right? So there is also the realm of the eternal. You might be, t- you might, you could use words like the, um, the world of nature and the world of grace or the natural, the supernatural, right? There are different ways of, of speaking about these things. But um, so the, the temporal world or the earthly world also serves a, a sacramental significance in that it, it points toward divine realities. So if you think about God, so the Catholic understanding of God is not like this Zeus figure out there, right? That the new atheists like to the straw man, new atheist. Or the like, spaghetti oh. monster, yeah. Right, right, right. Like God, God is not a being in the universe. God is big B being. God is the ground of all being, the source of being itself. Um, and for for the for the Catholic, that's a it's the Trinity. And there's also this understanding of God as love. So God is this this Trinitarian furnace of love that is the ground of all that exists. Okay. Now, how, how could something that big and beyond our understanding somehow break into our awareness? I mean, if you think about like, like what if you wanted to make yourself known to an ant, like an ant that just like lives in your backyard, you see it crawling and you're like, you want to have a relationship with that ant (laughs) and you want, Okay. to, you know, an I thou relation. You want to yeah, like yeah, yeah. make yourself known. Like, how could you possibly do that? Like, that seems crazy, right? So hmm. if you th- if you think about it that way, and like, if you think about God that way and how all of creation is part of God's self-disclosure to us, like everything that exists in the material world, including our bodies, including sexual difference, is a way of this invisible God, this invisible ground of all that is, like making himself known to us. Um, and so, for example, like to speak about sexual difference specifically, um, our capacity for nuptial union, these kind of complementary reproductive systems that can like create a new human being, that's amazing, um, also signal the spiritual reality of the human beings need for communion. Mm -hmm. Like that's part of our telos, right? Where it's not good for man to be alone, right? We're made for love. We're made for giving and receiving love. And that love is fruitful. That, that love is generative. It leads to new life. Like that's actually a sacramental sign that says something about God and his relationship with human beings, which is wanting to, um, 
give of himself so that we can have new life. Um, anyway, so that's, there's this, there's just this whole other layer, yeah. right? Uh, like the material world matters, but it also matters because of the way that it reveals um, reality beyond it. There, earlier in our conversation, you brought up the hermeneutics of suspicion. So now, mm -hmm. in a way, Catholicism, Catholicism is another hermeneutic. It, it's a yeah, way of a reading way of, into mm -hmm. the world yeah. a story. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it's a way of seeing. network mm -hmm. of meaning. Yes. Catholicism has this special little uh, added thing to it saying that this came from God itself. This is actually mm -hmm. like, you know, but, so um, mm -hmm. you can attack that, you can not attack that, mm -hmm. you know, but the, as opposed to the postmodern understanding, I don't even know where that comes from. Like if there's got to be like a origin, uh, an ontology of it, embedded in post or even just suspicion. I'm just going to be mm -hmm. suspicious of everything. Everything's a power structure. I guess that's Gnosticism. Everything's like this demiurgical system that I, if I know it, I can be free of it. Um, but hmm. yeah, I mean, postmodernism, I think it, and it's like, in its essence is suspicion toward meta narratives. Right. I mean, I think that's the, yeah. the leotard definition, um, which I think is is generally a good one. So that means meta narratives like Christianity. It also means meta narratives like Enlightenment modernism yeah. and science. <laughs> you know, it's like any or any kind yeah, of anything. Yeah, yeah, or Bitcoin. <laughs> I don't even know what that is. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so it doesn't. I mean, on the one that, so postmodernism. What's true about postmodernism? So I think postmodernism has some valid critiques of modernism, right? Because the the kind of neat and tidy enlightenment perception of the world, I think there are problems with it. Um, and so questioning that is understandable. Um, but the problem is, I think there's it's fundamentally just about suspicion and critique, right? Like there's not much positive content to it because the meaning that is created is, is always just cynical. that meaning that's created. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, it doesn't have to be cynical. Yeah. I think well, it can it, be, you it, know, in its activist forms, it, it begins to see everything as power and power is kind of con contentless or always right. serving oppression, uh, 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 oppressor oppressed narrative. And whereas what right. you were saying, earlier, which is so. a meta narrative, right? So that's even a weird form of postmodernism yeah. um, because it's like this meta narrative that all meaning and reality is fundamentally about power. Um, and then, but then also the goal sometimes for activists to really buy into that meta narrative is to achieve power. Right. So it's kind of like deconstructing power or tearing down the system. Right. Yeah. But the, I don't know. I guess I always, I don't know. I kind of get the sense of like, it's just hard to know, like, what, what do you want to happen? Like, is, is there anything, can this ever change? I even think this way about some feminist meta narratives about the patriarchy, right? Where the patriarchy almost seems like this it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, I guess is what I'm trying to say, where um, if you almost can't overcome the patriarchy because your entire Merida narrative is built upon the existence of the patriarchy, right? You know well, yeah, you I'm start saying? to see it it's everywhere like, or blame it for yeah. everything or it becomes responsible and then you don't be able to develop in your own responsibility. There was this pair of tweets that showed up on my timeline and one was from Laura, a detransitioner who I've interviewed. And Laura was saying, I was my whole transition and detransition narrative was about me denying the power of my femininity and my female body. And yeah. this journey is always, has been about deeply understanding the power of gender and, and the reality of that. And then the next tweet down after a tweet that was uh, being a little bit histrionic about abortion, the next tweet down was, or this tweet after that was about how I'm, uh, it was another woman saying that I just see how much men hate me 
and men are just filled with hate for women. And I, all that's all I can see. And, and I, sometimes I just want to give up hope because of that. And, you know, that was the blue check marked, um, one with thousands of likes, because like, that's a very salient belief system to say that the men are hatred. And if you look at the stats, yeah, men are violent, men are terrible, you know, but well, I mean, this, if you actually look at the stats, a minority, a small minority of men yeah. are the ones who are producing the vast majority well, of the, the violence. When you, yeah. you had your little moment when you were on the internet and a bunch of angry, you pissed off a bunch of men and they were mean mm-hmm. to you. Like you could have mm-hmm. extrapolated that into men are terrible beings, right? Yeah. And you know what I found out? Those men are wounded. Those men have been deeply wounded and they're angry and they're hurt and they're human beings, you know, I mean, that's, Hmm. that's what I found. That doesn't mean that, you know, some of the misogynist stuff that they would say isn't bad, you know, but it's also like, why would they, you know, like hearing some of their stories, it's like, yeah, you know, some, sometimes women do really awful things and really hurt men. And sometimes in, in pain, the reaction of those men is to create this arch villain of women, which is, you know, so yeah, I guess I, I don't like simplistic narratives. I mean, this kind of circles back almost to the beginning of our conversation about personalism, you mm-hmm. know, this attention to the human person in front of you and narratives that take us away from that, that blind us, that make us unable to be attentive to the complex, unique human person in front of us. Mm-hmm. I, I think those are those aren't good narratives, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and I think the the kind of gender affirmation, you know, medicalization train is one of those narratives, right? It's, it distracts us from actually figuring out what this person really wants and is experiencing because it's just, it's, it, you know, it actively sure. like it de-incentivizes, especially like doctors or therapists to actually do some exploration and figure out what might be going on. You know, it's like, nope, just write a script, wash your hands of it, you know, hmm. And that's not good. Punch is piloting their way through their career. Yeah, that's a great analogy, actually. <laughs> like, <laughs> ah, what is true? <laughs> so um, they told me to kill him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, they did. Like, uh, yeah. there's literally uh, activists at the gate uh, wanting uh, to crucify gender. So, so I have a question for you. Oh. I have two questions for you. Okay. Is that terrible yeah. if I ask? No, I turn sure. the tables. Okay. Do you get a lot of flack? Do you do you get a lot of online hate for platforming people like me and detransitioners? No, the only people that I've um, incentivized negative crowd behavior has been the feminists of all the people. The ones who. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, That's so funny. There's one. There's one rinky dink trans rights Mm -hmm. activist who's so called cis guy named Adrian Coomerfield or something like that. He's just this guy. He wrote a book, and all he does all day is bag on turfy feminists and tell them Mm -hmm. how they're not feminists. And I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. And then he brings me up as an MRA um, constantly. I'm like, okay, so that's the only guy, Mm -hmm. but he's like, nobody cares. I I don't know. I don't know, but no. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's good. Yeah. I don't know. Here's my second question. So you've, I mean, your, your podcast is such a wonderful archive of first person accounts of detransition. And you talk to so many people I guess, what do you hear as the most common themes in all those stories? Because they, they are really different, right? I, I think we got to resist simple yeah. narratives, but yeah. what, what commonalities, what common threads do you see? Well, there is a gender paradigm. There is a predilection to obsess about gender that is about, and, and I think it's a, it's a misreading of gender. It's a, it's a poor hermeneutic. It's, it's a, it's just a, bad reading of what sex is and there's a big split between females and males and there's uh, for a contingent of males there is a sexual component or sexual compulsion to it Um, and then for females uh, especially the younger this new generation they want to run away from their femininity some Mm -hmm. men want to run away from the masculine 
And they have this kind of this, this one version of the feminist narrative that they've internalized that men are the bad guys, men are the baddies. How are, how are men need to stop raping? Okay. I'll cut off my balls. Mm -hmm. Cause that's the only yeah. thing. And then there's, and then there's the homosexual um, uh, contingent of that, which is different from the males and the females. And mm-hmm. um, it's just this, this network of stuff. And then there's this tech, there's this Frankensteinian kind of thing that happens in Western medicine. It's like, okay, we have the answer. We have the answer. Here you go. Boom. Yeah. Oh, sorry. We tried to make you a dick and now it's fallen off. Mm-hmm. What it was was your idea we're just trying to Ugh, help you now so, yeah. so horrible um yeah. yeah yeah i mean the pathologization of what is normal right i mean it's yeah. i make the you know i make the critique i make the argument in the book that that that's happened with female with you know contraception and female embodiment like pathologizing female fertility right yeah. but then there's also now this yeah. pathologizing puberty right like pathologizing these normal processes no no it's not seeing them as like yeah like god nature you didn't consent to puberty it's not valid puberty is not valid unless you consent to it which is just phenomenally fucked up i'm sorry but it's just so screwed up it's like you can't okay now you're consenting to be born like i didn't want to consent to but now okay like we're just going to kill you then like, right. sorry, 20 year old kid, like you didn't consent to this. Yeah. We'll just take you out of the pool. Like where, where's the end game of this? And so that's, that's the problem I'm trying to figure out. Like liberalism has to rest on some sort of like understanding of common sense, but common sense, there's like elephants all the way down in a certain respect. And that's mm-hmm. where I'm um, attracted to different sorts of religious understanding, because even though you can say, well, this is kind of just guessed like, well, the foundation is pretty solid. And a lot of people have worked on this foundation of, of God or whatever this, this mm-hmm. thing that's outside of our understanding, but it, it, it has a firmer foundation than liberalism, which just kind of assumes rational actors. But mm-hmm. once the world goes crazy and once rationality becomes irrational, like, okay, mm-hmm. what's going to happen? Right. And you're right. I mean, like you said, med- mentioned before, it doesn't really accommodate human beings in states of dependency. Yeah. Right? Dependency. Which, yeah. Or carry yeah. Which we all yeah. go through, Yeah, you know? Yeah. We like to pretend yeah. not. We like to yeah. be agents. So the Genesis of gender, excellent book. What's ahead for you and are you working on things that people can read and and follow you on on Mm. some sort of blog or something like that so i i have one one pinky in social media and that's on twitter that's the only the only real thing you were like there was some weird like catholic drama Uh, that was going on but we don't have to get into uh, it but i'm like what why why are people yelling about a name what's going on (laughs) so there's drama everywhere Oh yeah. So I, yeah, I get it. So I get it from both sides. Right. Because um, I'm progressives think I'm, I'm too conservative. um, And then arch conservatives think I'm the devil because I (laughs) call myself a feminist. Right. So it's yeah. And that I wear pants. Ah! Oh, really? That's crazy. That's the thing. Like literally wearing pants. There's something funky going on in this little corner of Catholicism right now that has to do, I think, with American political polarization and too much time on YouTube for some people. But okay. yeah, so there is huh. there is this contingent of um, rad trads, as they're called, like oh, radical okay, yeah, yeah. journalists who uh, um, are they mostly male, mostly yeah. female or even split? I don't know. I mean, they they to me, like especially coming from Protestantism, like I I look at that and it's like, oh, that's Protestant fundamentalism with like a little bit of like Pope, Pope juice sprinkled on top or whatever, you know, it's like a Papist schmear. Yeah. Although many of them actually hate the Pope. So I'm like, what's going on here? It's this weird, like Protestant form of Catholicism. Oh, the um, current Pope, because he's kind of social justice too. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I actually really like Pope Francis. I think he, I think he is doing a, a middle road on a lot of things, which I think is good. Um, but yeah, he, because again, he cuts against these polarized camps, which I do as well. Mm. Um, you, you kind of get flack from both sides. 
So that's fun though. Fun right? times. But anyway, so I'm on Twitter at they can't Kabali cancel you, right? Abs. Is there yeah. like a Catholic cancellation policy? Like I don't know. Okay. Oh, don't martyrdom. Know, <laughs> <laughs> yes, martyrdom is Catholic cancellation. <laughs> exactly. Right. Um, anyway, so yeah, I'm on Twitter. Um, and anything I write, I usually remember to put it on there. Okay. Um, so yeah, but I'm hoping to to actually write. Um, Are you thinking about doing pieces, any yeah. new media, like uh, starting up a podcast or something like that, or going um, in that direction? No, like an no, but I'm, okay. you know, I'm just starting this new gig, so I just got to yeah. figure out what my job is. Uh, okay. But I do want to do more writing, so I'm excited about that. And, hmm. you know, I wrote this book like I finished writing it about a, a year ago, so. Yeah. Now that it's out, there's already more things I want to add to it, right? Like there are yeah. things I'm like, oh, I didn't talk about this or I want to expand on this. So it's a good, um, it's a good foundation yeah. for a lot of exploration. You bring up a yeah. lot of ideas that could be expanded upon that we didn't get to in this interview, but like there's yeah. tons there. There's tons there. Yeah. Anything that you would like to plug other than your book and yourself and your work? No, no that's it. That's enough. All right. Cool. I don't know. <laughs> Drink plenty of water. Oh, you're a hydro, I don't know. <laughs> hydro bro. Okay, that's fine. I don't know. I mean, I'm trying to. I'm yeah. like getting over this awful bronchitis. So I'm. Oh, okay. Although I just, I'm looking out the window and it's suddenly pouring down rain. Yeah, hmm. the the Midwest weather is tricksy. Oh well, yeah, you're because you, you were in the Pacific Northwest for quite some time. Now you're mm -hmm. in the uh, Midwest. Yeah, you're gonna have yes. to adjust to the winters, man. I'm actually very excited about that. I grew up in snow country. I have oh, okay. missed snow okay. so much. There we go. So I'll be fine. In, Winters, I'll be Introduce it to fine. your ch children. Mm -hmm. too, exactly. Well, thank you so much, Abigail, for yeah, joining thank me you. on this podcast. Yes, thank you. Um, yep. I'm. Wait, hold on.